we're going to see how far each monkey can get in chimps all on their own. Now, we've already done all the towers you can afford normally, so we're going to do the more expensive one. To make things fair, we started each monkey on what round we would be able to afford them on. So for our run with the ace, we'll be starting on round eight with $995. We placed it right below the track in the top middle of the map, set it to figure infinite and hit play. This way, it'll be spending most of its time either next to or right on top of the track, letting it pop the most balloons possible. From here, we saved up for a second ace, put it in the tiny square, and set it to figure eight. This will provide a ton of consistency for our run, as these two aces should be able to handle the early game. Now, we just upgraded our first ace to a 200 for some extra popping power, and then got our second to a 030 bomber ace. This guy spends so much time flying over the main part of the track that most of his pierce will be used all the time. With camos and lead secured, we needed to focus on the mob coming on round 40. So we got our first ace to a 420 operation dart storm. I really wanted to make it a 401 for that extra pierce, but this guy will likely be our main way of popping DDTs, so that camo detection of the middle crosspath will be pretty important. After this, we got our 023 never miss and set its flight pattern to the very right side of the track. This will increase its DPS as its darts will use more of their pierce on average. Now, the plan was to save straight up for a specter, which would carry us through the mid game, but round 49 had other plans. The huge rush of balloons caused a feudal leak through well before we could afford the specter. So we made our bomber ace a 230, and this extra attack speed let us pop all the regen rainbows that were causing us trouble. In fact, this was enough to pass the next few rounds and let us get our specter on round 55. From here, we cruised all the way to round 78, where we could afford a sky shredder. This is enough to take out the next several rounds, but the 90s will definitely give our setup a run for its money. So we started saving up for a czar bomba. We we got the ground zero on round 83, so if we ever got in trouble, we could drop a bomb to bail us out. But we'll only use that in extreme situations, definitely not right now. In fact, no round was difficult until 93 when the DDTs actually made it around the second loop. Still not close to leaking, but that was the furthest something has gotten in a while. Fortunately for us, the BFBs on this round gave us enough money for the Czar Bomba. Now, I haven't used this tower much at all in my several years of playing BTD6, but how hard could it be? Just drop the big bomb when you're about to lose and everything should be fine, right? Well, that's what we did on round 95 when the DDTs and ceramics got very far and the bomb was basically off cooldown by the time the ZOMGs came on screen next round. We didn't need to use the bomb again until round 98, but I was so afraid of the fortified DDTs on round 99 that we picked up a ground zero just to help out with the super ceramics. So we used both bombs on round 98 and then the Zar Bomba on round 99 to get past those two rounds. Then for round 100, we just waited until the main attacks from our four aces took out the outer layer of the bad, and then we double bombed the innards, letting us beat chimps with only aces. Onto the heli pilot. This guy is slightly more expensive, so we'll be starting on round 12 with $1,897. We plopped him down and locked him in place in the top right of the map, then we upgraded him to a 200 as fast as we could so we could set him to pursuit and not have to micro him ourselves. Now, the 20s were quickly approaching, and with them are camo and lead balloons. So we picked up IFR, making this guy a 220, and then then work towards getting razor rotors as they can pop lead. We got this just in time, making him a 320 on round 27. Now, saving straight up for a 420 would be difficult, so we just got down a second heli and upgraded it to a 220. This one will eventually become a downdraft, but for now, we'll leave it as is. With this little bit of extra damage, we were able to get an Apache dart ship on round 49, just in time as we were going to leak if we couldn't get this upgrade. Then we picked up downdraft on our second heli and started the long long save up for the Apache Prime. This was not bad at all as Resort is so long that the dart ship could pop all the mob class balloons and Downdraft would stall the ceramics long enough for the dart ship to handle. That being said, round 76 was a problem. Unfortunate as we were only a couple thousand dollars away from the Apache Prime upgrade. In order to get past this round, we had to put our blowback heli at the very front of the map to split up the wave a little bit. It's okay if it creates a small regrow farm as long as the ceramics were a little more spread out. This worked wonderfully and with a little micro of the Apache Prime, we were able to beat the round. Round 77 was getting pretty far as well, but by the time the balloons got to the bottom of the screen, we were able to upgrade our heli pilot to a 520 which went right back to destroying everything. This should last a while, 
so the next thing we need to prepare for are DDTs. While the Apache Prime can handle a few of them, there's no way it'll be able to beat round 95. So we started saving up for a special operations as a Marine in the small square might be able to carry us. And that extra blowback of Super Ceramics will be a nice addition to our defenses. Because rounds 80 and up rewards so much money, we were able to get it on round 88 right before the DDT started coming. Now, we just needed a little stalling, so we picked up three heli pilots and made them 023s. While we do have to micro these three, the increased mob shove from bigger jets and the camo detection from IFR makes them much better at stalling blimps, especially DDTs, and they slowed down round 95 enough for us to beat them. Then, over the next few rounds, we upgraded these three to 024 Comanche defenses, and it was more than enough to take out the bad. Next up is the Mortar Monkey. Here, we get to start on round 7 with $813. This was a pretty easy start as the base mortar has good damage, range, and pierce. But we did have to micro a bit anytime a green balloon snuck through. And while I wanted to pick up bigger blast and balloon buster for more consistency, we were forced to rush heavy shells as we need to pop the black balloons on round 20. This was still pretty convenient though as not many balloons got by once we picked up rapid reload. On round 15, we got heavy shells further increasing its consistency. This could become totally hands off, but we don't have the luxury of cross pathing it. Instead, we had to get down a brand new mortar and make it a 003 as fast as possible so we can decamo round 24. What's crazy is that when the camo balloon came out, we were $16 short of the upgrade. So we microed a mortar to pop some of the blue balloons, giving us enough money to purchase signal flare and decamo the green. Now we can go back and make our heavy shells mortar a 230, which will pop anything that tries to get around the first small square. And this actually let us save all the way to round 37, where we made it a 240 artillery battery. This was great as the ability will let us take down mob class balloons much easier. To prevent us from any freak leaks, we made our signal flare a 023 to more reliably decamo everything Thing, and then it was time to focus on more popping power. So we got down a third mortar monkey and made him a 320. This was more than enough to pop the rounds, and we upgraded it to a 520 biggest one on round 66. From here, we had several options, but I figured we'd lock up any auto losses first. So we got our signal flare to a shattering shells as it's able to decamo DDTs, which will let our other two mortars help out. Plus, it's stripping the fortified property off of mobs and BFBs is pretty nice. We got this on round 74 though, leaving us with tons of time and future money to spend. Naturally, we had to go for the Axis of Mortar and get all three tier 5s down if possible. So we upgraded our Shattering Shells to a Bloon Cineration on round 85 and then worked towards a popping off. No round was difficult because the Bloons had to pass over the Bloon Sins fire so many times on top of the fact that the biggest one was constantly stunning and popping everything that was inside the first two loops. Even still, I was a little worried about round 95 as we didn't have the pop in awe yet, but the balloon sin was able to decamo every DDT and not a single one of them made it to the bottom of the screen. This let us get the pop in off around 96, but we didn't use its ability until around 99, where I wanted to make sure the fortified DDTs were popped. Plus, we'll definitely have it back up by the time we take out the bad's outer layer. So, on to round 100. We microed the mortar monkeys to be attacking the bad for the entire track. Even with this micro, the bad made it to the final pass before its outer layer layer was pop. But right when the DDTs and ZOMG spilled out, we activated Papana, which brought everything to a halt, letting us pop everything inside. We're 3 for 3 so far on what expensive towers can beat chimps all on their own, and we're on to the Dartling Gunner, one of the best towers in the game. Here, we get to start on round 8 with $995, and we placed them on the very right side of the screen, shooting down that long straight away. The rounds were very easy, and we quickly made this guy a 0-2-0 for extra attack speed and the ability to see camera balloons. Next, we picked up powerful darts to make round 21 easier, but we had one massive problem. Let's. The cheapest way to pop them with a dartling gunner is with hydro rocket pods, and even if we hadn't spent the money on powerful darts, we still wouldn't be able to afford it by round 28. So, we have our first fail of the day. Moving on, we have the super monkey. This is our latest start as it takes until round 16 to have enough money for this guy. We plopped him down in the small square and watched him annihilate the rounds. That is, until round 24 when the camo balloon came out and we weren't even close to affording knockback, let alone ultra vision. 
so the super monkey lost in round 24. Shifting gears, we have a redemption attempt for the sniper monkey. I got stuck in round 95 with this guy last video, but Seraphim327 sent me a guide on how he beat those pesky DDTs and maybe even the bat. His video is linked in the description. We booted up Scrapyard and placed a sniper on top of one of the big crates. This gave him just enough time to pop all of round six and let us afford a second sniper for round seven. These two trucked along and we picked up Shrapnel and then FMJ on our first sniper. This not only added tons of crowd control, but also takes care of our future camo and lead problem. Next, we made our second sniper a 102. This handled the rounds for a while, but 27 was a bit too much. So we picked up a third sniper, making it a 120 as well. We might have been able to get by by activating the crusher, but we're going to try to beat round 100 without using this thing at all. Anyway, these three let us save up long enough to upgrade our first sniper to a 130 bouncing bullet for even more crowd control. Then we upgraded our second sniper to a 103 for tons of single target damage that we'll need for the mob class balloons that are heading our way very soon. This worked great, popped the round 40 mob, and let us save up for a supply drop in the early 40s. Ideally, we would go straight for an elite sniper, but round 49 had other plans for us as there were just a little too many regen rainbows. So we pivoted to upgrading our second sniper to a 204 and set it to strong. This made the rounds much easier, and since these rounds provide so much more, money, we were still able to afford the elite sniper upgrade on round 54. We rounded this guy out by making him a 250, then upgraded our second sniper to a 205 elite defender in the middle of round 63. This let us cruise through the rounds, punishing any balloons that came on screen until super ceramics started coming in the 80s. These first couple rounds took a bit of micro to take down, but at the start of round 82, we had enough money to pick up a cripple mob, completing our axis of havoc and drastically increasing our DPS and stalling potential. Now we just needed tons of mob damage with a little bit of ceramic popping power, so the choice was simple. 024 snipers. We got two of these guys down on a crate to the left and then reserved space for future snipers. These base guys won't do much, but it's nice to see how much space we have left up there. I definitely wouldn't say the rounds were easy as the balloons were getting pretty far every round, but we were scraping by. This brings us to round 95 the round I got stuck on last time. We had $25,000 to spend and several snipers to spend it on. So we got our guy down bottom to a 420 for some extra stalling and a sniper up top to a 024 for even more damage to anything that doesn't have the lead property. And even with all this, we still barely popped the super ceramics before they leaked. But boys, we have a new record for the sniper and we're not done yet. Run 96 and 97 were pretty simple as we just hit play and watch the snipers do their thing. Thing. While they were popping though, we upgraded our final two snipers on the crates to 024s, finishing this at the start of round 98. This brought us to round 100, where the bad didn't stand a chance. We had so much single target damage on top of a cripple mob that it just melted. And to top it off, we picked up a final main mob to help out with the child balloons inside. But just like that, the snipers joined the list of towers that can beat chimps on their own. Thanks, Seraphim. On to another tower that gets redemption, the Wizard Monkey. We lost to purples on round 25 last time as we couldn't afford a Necromancer in time. However, the comments let me know that his fireball's explosion can actually pop purples. It's just difficult to pull off. To start, we got a wizard in the little square and upgraded him to a 010. I really wanted to pick up Wall of Fire to make the rounds easier, but we figured that saving this money for an earlier Necromancer was likely the play. Anyway, we picked up a second 010 wizard and the rounds started flying by. We upgraded our first one to a 012 so he could pop the camo balloon coming on 24. Then we got mentally prepared for round 25 where those dreaded purples start coming. Right away, we saw that if a fireball hit a non-purple balloon, its explosion could pop nearby purples. So we had a challenge. We need to keep the regrow yellows alive long enough for the purples to enter the square, but we needed to have enough popping power to handle everything once we pop the purple layers. And so began 36 minutes of grinding round 25 until we stumbled into this solution. We had to wait until the final regrows were on the second pass outside the wizard's range before we could put down a third wizard. We instantly upgraded this guy to a 010 and then waited until the first purple was at the bottom left of the pool. Here, we placed a fourth wizard by the umbrella and made him a 010 as well. This worked out to pop all the purple balloons before the final pass, letting us clean up the rest of the balloons. Now, round 32 also has purples, 
but we were able to save up for a necromancer right before they spawned. While it's possible to beat them without this upgrade, I did not want to have to grind another half hour if I didn't need to. From here, we picked up a wall of fire on our necromancer and upgraded our wizard up top to a 032 dragon's breath. This gave us plenty of damage to save up for a prince of darkness, which we got in the middle of round 55. It took a bit of experimenting, but we got his reanimated balloons to spawn in a spot that was perfect. If a balloon was popped by a wizard or zombie, balloon, it would be in range of the prince, making sure that his graveyard will stay full. Next, we upgraded the remaining two wizards to 032s. Probably not needed, but the extra damage will be nice. Not sure what to do next, we got down a new wizard to the right of our prince and made this guy a 402. While still in a good spot to pop the balloons, I wanted to make sure that he was behind the prince as we wanted to keep that graveyard full. This crushed the rounds and let us save all the way to round 82, where we were able to upgrade this new wizard to a 502 arc mage. Now, I really wanted to see if this would win as is, but a cooler idea came to mind. Axis of Wizards, which is apparently the second theme of this challenge. On round 97, we upgraded one of our Dragon's Breath Wizards to a 052 Wizard Lord Phoenix, and with its ability, rounds 98 and 99 didn't stand a chance. Round 100 still got pretty far though, as our Prince of Darkness struggles against the bad, but its outer layer was popped as it started the second loop, and shortly after, we took down the ZOMGs and DDTs inside, making the wizard join the ranks of being able to beat chimps all on its own. The next two we have are the village and farm. Obviously, both of these lost right away, but I figured I'd include them. The farm was kind of funny as we had to put it in hard standard to even place it down, but it didn't matter as it still leaked right away. But finally, we have the Spike Factory. Logs was the clear choice for the map, but I wasn't sure how the start would go as we're starting on round 9 with $1,195. This let us get a base factory at the end of the track, and it was enough to pop all the green balloons on this round. Round 10, though, kept sneaking a few balloons through, so we got the only upgrade we could afford, long reach. And surprisingly, it was enough. You see, the spikes didn't last the whole round, so some of them would disappear by the time the blues got to the end of the track. So with long reach, we got to use some of these spikes that would normally disappear earlier in the round, as some spikes would be placed far enough right to hit the balloons early on. And this let us comfortably beat the round. Next, we got smart spikes for the increased attack speed early in the round, and we could target them where we wanted. So for now, we could put them early on in the track to speed up the rounds. This let us go all the way to round 15, where we picked up the bigger stacks upgrade and the rounds got much easier. Easy enough to save up for a second spactory that we put right below the pond in the middle of the map. We made this guy a 200 and put our first spactory on close as we no longer wanted to use its spikes early on. Instead, we'll keep these as a last line of defense. Back to our new spactory, we upgraded him to a 220 so he was just flinging white hot spikes all over like the menace he is. And now we have a decision to make. Should we upgrade our first spactory to a long life spikes for a bigger safety net at the end of the track, or should we get spiked balls for even more damage in the middle of the track? We opted for long life spikes just because it was the cheaper upgrade and we wanted to start piling those spikes at the very end. We still managed to get spiked balls for round 36 though, so I think we could have gone either way and been fine. On round 39, we picked up deadly spikes, which not only doubles the damage of each spike, but also lets spikes last three rounds instead of two. They still disappear after 140 seconds, but if we have some quick rounds, that extra round of life could be huge for us. This setup worked great, allowing us to save money and beat the mid 40s with little trouble. And it was round 46 where we got the spiked mines upgrade, which will dumpster the rounds for the foreseeable future. In fact, this soloed the balloons to round 63, where we were able to purchase the perma spike upgrade. Now we just needed some more mob damage, so we got down a 240 spike storm with the plans of making it a carpet of spikes. This was a nice save up as we could just pop its ability anytime tons of blimps or balloons were on screen. That being said, things did get difficult in the early 80s as Super Ceramics loved gobbling up all of our spikes in the middle of the track, letting the other balloons get way too far. Luckily, the Perma Spectre was able to clean everything up as its massive wall of spikes has been untouched for several rounds. And before its giant wall got worn down, we could afford the Carpet of Spikes upgrade on round 84, which put us 
back in the driver's seat. Even without its ability, we were popping the balloons no problem. A great showing of this was round 95, where we didn't use an ability and only Super Ceramics made it to the Permus factory. And we still had over $40,000 to spend if we got in trouble. Round 96 though, is where we started using the carpet's ability as I wanted to save as many of the Perma spikes as possible and I wasn't sure how round 98 would go. This turned out to be a good choice as we spammed this ability for all of round 98 and still tons of balloons made it to the very end. Not enough to get through though, but the wall at the end of the track got noticeably smaller. Luckily, round 99 was pretty easy and the bad got hard countered by the carpet of spikes. I was pretty shocked by how fast we popped its outer layer and not a single balloon made it even halfway through the track on round 100. But those were the expensive towers. If you want to see the other 13 monkeys try to solo chimps, click on this video right here.